Jim's first meditation teacher was Michael Murphy, whom some of you know is the co-founder of the Esalen Institute. Him and Murphy were two of the principal founders of the citizen diplomacy movement, which I'm old enough to remember. Um, and Roger, and Roger. And excuse me, oh, I didn't know about Roger, but Roger was there yeah. too. Um, he and um, my, um, Murphy and maybe Roger also, they created a series of scientific and cultural exchanges between the US and the, and the Soviet Union. I guess it was in the 70s. Jim was an assistant to Stanley Krippner right after he, Jim um, managed to get himself out of serving in the Vietnamese war. Um, he wrote a letter to, um, to Krippner who said, why don't you be my assistant? Krippner, as some of you know, is one of, was a pioneer researcher in the study of consciousness. He worked at the Myomodini days, I can't say it, Myomodini days. Anyway, some dream laboratory with Stan, and um, he began working in the area of Kirlian photography and captured some images with the, um, some people say fraudulent Israeli psychic Yuri Geller. He and his colleague- Jim But more important, Angelo, is that I took the first Kirlian photograph of the marijuana leaf. That, there you go. <laughs> yes. Remember that, Roger? Yeah, it was a good one, too. And actually, three other people in the last 30 years have claimed they did it. It's such a good photo, you know. It's a very good photo. Him and Jim Garrison, who's a lifelong colleague, probably also along with Roger, they transformed the Michael Fox, excuse me, Matthew Fox, Matthew Fox. Matthew Fox founded Wisdom University into Ubiquity University, which is an accredited global university designed for social impact. And as Jim told me, um, before they started it, they um, they had a kind of a an idea that the best thing to do with education, and if you could put yourself on mute, if you're um, not talking, uh, there would not be background noise. Um, uh, they wanted to start education for the 21st century, the next generation, and that's what that's the that's the that's why Ubiquity University um, was formed. Um, at Ubiquity, he teaches the uh, the popular applied neuroscience course, and um, one of the things which you'll discover about Jim, maybe that at least I discovered about him, is that he's one of these kind of people. Is that when you encounter him, uh, he just takes in what you have to give. So, in the course of my conversations with Jim, J Jim got. Um, for, Jim said, oh, neuroscience, spirituality. So this is a way, is a practicum for a longer thing that he's going to be doing in September uh, for the Ubiquity University. And we're delighted that you're here. And Jim, the floor is yours. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you. No, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, you know, it's a, this is a big subject. It's bigger than I can comprehend. And one of the, my little jokes about it in the beginning, Angela said, why don't we do neuroscience and enlightenment? And so I started researching all I could about it. And I realized on the one hand, enlightenment is an experience, but for me, it's become an intellectual exercise. So trying to pull all this together um, has been both very interesting and uh, challenging for me because there's so much information now about um, both topics, spiritual practice and neuroscience. So there's more data in the slides I will use to illustrate the talk than you'll be able to comprehend in this hour and a half. Um, and so I encourage you to sort of listen, pay attention, write down questions, send them to Angelo, because there are four different places we're going to break and do question and answer on the topics that we've covered. Um, because after this, I'll send everybody a PDF, because we're talking about information that if you, if you implement it in your life, changes your life. But it requires study and commitment and, and, um, and regular practice in a sense. So what I've done is put together as much as I could um, what those practices could, would be in order to you know, 
what I, the title of the book I'm writing calls Successful Living in Turbulent Times. And this last point is important because I want to just start with a little context for you all so you understand, in a sense, where I'm coming from. Um, I believe that the future is going to continue to be unpredictable, very turbulent, um, and, and in a sense, a challenge for the generation of political leaders who believe that solutions from the last century are applicable to the solution to the problems of the 21st century, and they aren't. It's going to be a completely different world. And that's why I was saying earlier how important this is for young people, because the younger generations are going to make the new world that's coming. And we get to assist them with wisdom and guidance, etc. Um, and so I'm hoping that out of this um, set of information slides, in a sense, um, you'll find things that are of value to you. Um, and then the last thing is just the context for me. We're talking about a time where science and the wisdom traditions are now interfacing in a way they never have in the whole history of humankind. Um, and that's a challenging time, but it's also an incredible time. Um, but it does mean that we need to have some sort of similar understanding of the terminology we use. So for me, spiritual practice, for example, is a wide variety of possible practices, some of which might fit within a religious tradition, some of which might fit just within your own um, personal practice type thing. Um, so I'm not trying to exclude anybody I'm trying to include all of what we can imagine that results from how science, quantum physics, neuroscience, et cetera, um, have begun to speak similar language that the wisdom traditions have talked about. And the, the last point on that is my main interest is and how we bring our spiritual practice, enlightenment, if you will, our progress toward enlightenment into this world. You know, traditionally, um, committed contemplatives walking down the path toward enlightenment were geared toward once you get enlightened, you leave this world behind. It's a world of suffering and illusion, et cetera. And that's not where our, in a sense, soul is intended to be. But in, as most of you know, in the last 20, 30 years, a number of those sorts of teachers have come back to say, no, when you get there, we got to bring it back into this world. Because the interface between the physical world and the spiritual world is a crucial um, meeting, in a sense, that has great uh, possibilities for the universe and the expression of life. So that's sort of what I'm mainly interested in. And um, that's what I emphasize here. It's kind of the um, interface between the two. Now, the last thing I'll say is that um, I learned quite some time ago at a workshop where I was that um, there's value in some kind of a regular reminder throughout the day to just take a breath and stop and be mindful of the present moment. So in this workshop, we had a mindfulness bell that we would strike every, what, 30 minutes. So on my computer, I've set it for every hour. So at 1 o'clock my time, there'll be a little voice that says, it's 1 o'clock. And that's what it reminds me. Whatever I'm doing, I just stop for a minute and, you know, I thank God for whatever and stuff. So when you hear that, do whatever is you're, you're driven to do. And in the meantime, we're going to move into this. So there are a couple of important um, principles that we're going to walk through and they, that are down here at the bottom. Um, Rick Hansen is one of the better uh, neuroscience teachers in the world, in my opinion, 
um, partly because he's been a committed meditator for 30 years, and he's a psychotherapist, and he's a neuroscience researcher. So he brings it all together with his patients. And he's written a number of books. In fact, one of them, Angelo, I saw you're doing a one of these meetings on um, uh, his book on happiness. There's a review, there's a summary of that book that's coming up um, as one of the uh, network's um, Saturday meetings. But anyway, that's Rick Hansen. And one of the things he said is the brain takes its shape from what the mind rests upon. In other words, whatever we think about, feel, imagine, experience, affects the structure and function of our brains. And secondly, neurons that fire together, wire together, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's just a, a, a drilling down a little bit further into the brain, the fundamental structure of the brain and the way it communicates is through neurons. And when they sync up with one another, then a pathway is built in the brain that becomes a habit if you reinforce it over time. And our challenge, our opportunity is to restructure those pathways so that our brain, so that we create the brain that then moves us into the world in a way that we really want it to, rather than letting the brain decide from all of the inputs that it's had for, the, for our lifetime. And then the other piece I'll speak about briefly is hypercomplexity. Uh, it's, a, it's the state of the world these days where so many things are going on and we're in the middle of them right now, of one of them right now. There's so many things going on that intersect with one another and operate simultaneously that no one person, no human intelligence can possibly understand the intricacies of all of these interactions. And that's what we've seen over the last year with the virus. No one's been able to, no one first ever believed it was gonna happen. And then secondly, it's been extremely difficult to figure out how to deal with it. So I wanna start with consciousness because what we've learned from the brain is that um, our consciousness in a sense is made up of, and it's simplifying it, is made up of experiences from the world around us, from the outside. But it's also equally dependent upon the self inside. The brain a stream of electric impulses. The brain doesn't see any of this and register it and say, well, that's what reality is. The brain is just a bunch of electrical impulses. And it combines all these signals with in a sense, unconscious beliefs, prior input about the way the world is and forms an image within us that is basically takes the shape of how we view the world. So perception, our experience of the external world comes as much from the inside out as from the outside in. And this is consciousness. It's much bigger than our little sense of of what we see outside of ourselves. And inside the self, there's several different pieces. You know, awareness of the body, first person point of view, I'm doing this, intending to do things and believing we're the cause of it. Then we have a rich set of memories and social interaction that is a part of our experience of being a continuous and distinctive person over time. But all of these things are pieces of what make up our experience. And given what the brain does is collect in collect data from the outside and then makes a best guess based on previous experience about what it all means and projects that to us. So even experiences of what our body is, is a best guess by the brain. So we have to just remember that the brain is always trying to figure out how, in a sense, reality is shaped based on its previous experience and current input from the outside. Then spirituality is a different 
arena, in a sense. It's about perceived external realities regarding man's ultimate nature or the human. That's a terrible thing to say, Jim. I have to, I have to edit that. Human's ultimate nature, in contrast to the, te the temporal or worldly view. And it's about a connection to something greater than oneself, a fundamental non-material aspect of the universe. So we're talking about how a non-material aspect of the universe now interfaces with the physicality that we experience as ourselves. And most studies show that religious involvement and spirituality um, are associated with better health outcomes, greater longevity, et cetera. It's a, it's a significant um, healthy attitude, let's say. And now with neuroscience, we're beginning to see the different brain regions that are associated with our spiritual practice. So this is what I call where spirit and matter meet, the neuroscience of spiritual practice. And here's a little bit of detail. I don't wanna spend much time on different areas of the brain like the prefrontal cortex, um, you know, is activated during process of meditation and that's connected to the focus of attention, et cetera. But you can look at these things and see that we're now, we're now recognizing that there are a lot of different parts of the brain that light up in a sense that are, that are um, stimulated through different types of contemplative practice. And that's beginning to tell us something about the process of moving toward, in a sense, an enlightened state. Um, and that structural evidence shows that meditation practice promotes neuroplasticity or the capacity for the brain to reshape itself in form and function, which we'll talk about in a minute. So it motivates us to better understand our bodies. That's why, you know, people say, why are you interested in neuroscience? And it's actually, how do we begin to really apprehend the capacity, the design, the function of our bodies as a vessel for this spiritual essence to interface, to be understood, to, um, be, to work with, in a sense. Um, so then we get to the body and the brain. And as we all know, there are two parts of it. There's the conscious brain, which we're fully aware of, and the subconscious. And this is a well-known little illustration that the subconscious brain, which, which contains a significant amount, some people say 80%, 60% of all of the data that motivates us to take action in the world is below the threshold of consciousness. So part of our, our work in this is to restructure that subconscious um, and change that information in a way that it's no longer a result of what happened when I was two weeks old or in the womb or between the time I was born and 10, when my parents, the people around me, et cetera, all told me about how the world works. It's all sitting there now and the brain processes that and, and puts it as an overlay on whatever consciously <coughs> we're hoping we can become. We have to have a real commitment to, um, to integrate the two. So I'll just go through quickly a little bit of Neuroscience, it's about the study of the nervous system. And again, I talked about neurons and, and here are the different pieces, which you can look at a little later. Um, but it, but you know, what's important here is that this part down here has been with us for 250,000 years. And this part has only been developed um, much, much more recently. And is one of the things that distinguishes us from the rest of the animals, the frontal lobe. Um, but this part um, is a part of what brings into our motivation and in a sense unconsciously designs how we relate to the world in a significant way because of what we learned to do when we were living in caves 200,000 years ago. And a part of the restructuring is about we don't need all of that kind of, of motivation anymore. It's time to 
take it under our own control, use it as it is good for us, but not um, be at its effect in experiences where we don't need to react as if there's a lion in the bush, which I'll talk about. This is important because this is how neurons communicate with one another. Um, through electrical impulses and actually biochemical. Um, and, and there's a gap between the neurons um, that called synapses. And when, a when one neuron begins to communicate with another, it emits certain biochemicals that go into down here, the receptor on the other neuron, and those electrical, biochemical and electrical stimulations are related to that earlier quote, neurons that wire together, fire together, because that wires them together. And when a million of those carry the same signal to a million connections, that becomes a well-trod pathway in our brain that defines much of who we are, who we want to be, how we act, react in the world, etc. Now, one of the interesting things about this is a uh, neuroscience scientist and a quantum physicist at UC Berkeley, and I were talking about this some years ago, and he said that in some cases, the, the structure of the biochemical atom, in a sense, is larger than the receptor. And the only way it can be absorbed into that accompanying neuron is as a quantum effect. So in a sense, it's a possibility that at the most fundamental structure of our functioning in the brain especially, but other parts of our body, there's a quantum field at work. And I bring it up, this is important for two reasons. One, because our imagination is really important in rewiring this, creating new pathways in our brain. And secondly, in the quantum world, as most of you may know, um, the quantum world is about possibilities, not absolutes. And in the quantum world, until there's some kind of attention on a quantum field, it doesn't collapse into physical reality. So this, these two are related. If there's a quantum effect going on in here and we, we project our attention and intention through our imagination into this world, then we have a huge <laughs> possibility of affecting our brain in a way that it creates the external world in the way we'd like to see it. And there are two important parts of the brain, we don't need to get into the rest, but the amygdala, which is um, many of you have probably heard about, but it's one of those um, cave person parts of the brain, which was always the alarm bell. It's the fight or flight um, um, activator in our system and um, very important for us uh, evolutionarily, as Rick Hansen always describes it, um, if I'm a cave person and I'm walking out in the field and uh, I want to know or suspect if there's a lion in the bush, because if there's a lion in the bush and I don't pay attention to that, then bang, my DNA is gone from the gene, gene pool. But if there's a lion in the bush and it, it, if there's not a lion in the bush, and I believe there is, it's more important, Mother Nature decided, it was more important to make that mistake 99 times so you didn't make it the hundredth time. And so the amygdala is the, is the stimulus in us that alarms us all the time. When someone gets angry at us, it, it's, it gets activated. When, uh, at the same time, when a car is rushing toward us, it gets activated and we jump out of the way. So it's important to us, but it also interferes with our interactions these days because it's no longer as important as it was 250,000 years ago. So one of the focuses of the, of the neuroscience practice is around maintaining more of a, in, say, in a sense, embracing loving relationship with our amygdala 
So it doesn't any longer treat us as if we were um, an early part of the human species. And then the prefrontal cortex is important because it's, it's primarily involved in higher cognition planning, proper social behavior. So a lot of the neuroscience stuff focus and, and meditation focuses on the prefrontal cortex in order to um, affect the kind of, of health attitudes and effects that it has. Um, and then we now know that actually it's a heart brain system um, that in the heart, there are neurons that connect to the brain and have a huge impact on how the heart brain system works. And of course, most of this comes out of the Heart Math Institute Research Center in Northern California. But the heart brain, which is now what I call this whole system, um, communicates in these four different ways neurologically, biochemically, biophysically, energetically. So, one of the exercises we want to do now is with the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve over here is a very interesting um, part of the, of the physiology because the vagus nerves are the longest nerves of the autonomic nervous system. It goes, it goes from, from the, the neck all the way down through most of the um, organs at the lower uh, stomach. So including hearts, lungs, digestive tract, neck chase, et cetera. And there's a very simple way to affect it. And that's what we're gonna do. So I would just ask us, uh, I would just ask us for a minute to um, follow these directions over here. You just close our eyes, breathe for a minute, and place your hand on your neck, just in the neck, and then you just slowly caress down the front of your body into the abdomen, and you go hand by hand, then you put the next hand down. You do it slowly, just caressing the outside of the body from the neck to the stomach. And that is having a direct impact on the vagus nerve. And it's calming it down in a sense. It's sending a signal through the vagus nerve to the heart, the lungs, digestive tract, etc., that everything's okay, just relax. And you only have to do it for about two minutes to make that, to have a huge impact on what's going on inside the body. So it's just one of those examples of how we're learning to, to, in a sense, manipulate the body in a way that affects mind and spirit. So um, I want to take the break here and have some discussion. Anything, um, uh, questions, comments from anyone at this point? Angelo, has anyone sent you questions? Um, no, um, but you can put it in the chat or you can do it um, live, um, but make sure you, um, you know, can you raise your hand or just talk um, and, uh, you know, you can ask questions. But Anyone have, want to say anything? All right, I'll start with the question, Jim, since everybody's shy. Um, one of the things that interests me about this whole endeavor is that it seems to imply that um, if we know more about the workings of the brain and how it affects our nervous systems and uh, our emotions uh, and, and our body, it seems to imply from that, that uh, the more we know, uh, the more we can, uh, let's say, shape a spiritual practice which is appropriate for us. Um, is that right? Do you have any, any sense about that? Well, I think, yeah, I think there are uh, two parts to it. One is that whatever spiritual practice you have, which you'll see in the coming slides, has a huge impact on the body. And um, it's true for all of them. They, from Franciscan nuns who are praying and have an experience of Jesus coming into them to Kundalini yogis, you know, the Dalai Lama, or any of us who practice some kind of regular meditation, it has a huge impact on the body. And that we're learning because of the research in neuroscience that has 
brought so much of the technology to measure the body into this kind of study. Um, so, and because we're comparing the two, you're absolutely right. We can then begin to choose, well, this particular contemplative practice seems to um, lead toward, um, uh, you know, reduce my depression, um, lead me toward a happier life, et cetera. And so, yes, um, it does lead us into that. So I'll just go on. And these are just a couple of concepts that I think it's important to understand because the practices I'm going to talk about are related to this. And it's basically, as I said in the beginning, that um, the world has become so complex um, that no one individual, or in many cases, groups of individuals, can understand or predict what's going on. And it's a part of what's happened uh, as we've understood the nature of hypercomplexity that, that as complex systems come together, they interact in such a way that they emerge into something more than they were before. And that emergence can't be readily predicted from a knowledge of the constituents of the system. And um, Jim, I'm going to interrupt you for a second because there's one person that has oh, a question and I'll let Marilyn ask. Yeah. Hi. Um, so this is actually going back to earlier in your presentation um, when you sort of went on a little tangent about quantum, <laughs> uh, quantum effects. Yeah. And, uh, I was wondering, like, what, what is the relationship? And I'm not, it sounded like there are maybe two thoughts going on here. One, if the molecules, the neural molecules are too big <laughs> for the receptors, what happens? <laughs> and how does that relate to what you're saying about the quantum um, effects of intentionality on these receptors and molecules? Well, you know, it's not, I don't want to overstate it. It's not accurate that they're all too big. Um, this, uh, one of the mentors of mine at UC Berkeley, quantum physicist, uh, who's also a neuroscientist, saw that in some cases that's true. And he postulated, therefore, that at that level, it's no longer a physical object. It's made up of a quantum field. And when you're, when you're in the quantum world, physicality is no longer a, either a dimension or a limitation. And so, and, and so that's one thing. The second thing is that what we understand about quantum effects is that, that in the quantum world, in a quantum field, in a sense, um, there are many possibilities that exist simultaneously. And according to the way we've, we, we relate to this in the lab, et cetera, um, not until we observe that field does it collapse into physicality. So if that's going on in the brain, then on the one hand, it collapses because of its interaction with the other neuron. But on the other hand, our imagination can play the role of the observer and then collapse that quantum field in a way that moves the neurons in a direction to create a pathway toward the behavior we're looking for, instead of the behavior that was dictated to us many years ago by other people and is res resident and unconscious. So that's sort of where they seem to interface. And, you know, we can't overstate this. This is we know so little about how the, all this works, um, but there is an association there. And it is a question that many sort of philosopher physicists have been wrestling with over the years. How does the quantum world relate to the reality? Because in a sense, you know, it's like Einstein said, um, the external world is an illusion. It's a complete illusion. It's a very seductive illusion, but it is an illusion because at the quantum, the most fundamental level of all of what we see, there is no um, physicality in our sense. 
Um, it's only until it collapses into the physical world. And so we're now getting into, you know, a lot of, of um, ideas about theories and stuff. But why it's important is because a part of the practices we're going to look at involve um, how we use our imagination, our attention. our structure of our brain, heart, gut system in a way that they begin to move us into life that we're looking for, not just the life that happen if we leave them to their own devices in a sense. And it could be that the quantum world has an impact on that as it has had on the structure of the universe. Does that help you at all? So I was saying that, you know, the, wor the world now is so complex. I mean, I'll show you that one little side. I need to update it. But it just gives you a sense of all of these different inputs in the last 10 years, 20 years have come together in a way that no one can figure out how they can all interact and what the result is going to be. And so it's a hyper complex system. Now, at the same time, the brain appears to be the most hyper complex system that we know. And here's a little description of it. Three pounds of little tissue that's mushy, mushy like tofu, a trillion brain cells, a hundred billion neurons, always on, never shuts down, 24-7, 365, and it requires about 20 to 25% of all the blood flow and oxygen of the body, but it only weighs three pounds. So it is this incredibly complex system. Neurons, those little, um, that little picture you saw, they fire five to 50 times a second. Signals crossing your brain a 10th of a second and the brain regions linked by neural impulses synchronize within a few milliseconds. So when we begin to um, take action to affect how our brain is structured and how it performs, we're talking about a few milliseconds oh, yes, of so. millions, 500 trillion synapses in the brain can be affected. And so, and, you know, as I've said before, if anyone saw my other, um, um, recording, you know, when I was, I don't know, Roger, when we took our first neuros, our first physiology course, let's say, in, in high school, we were always taught that, you know, by the time you're about 25, your brain is set, never changes again. And that is what we thought for the last, you know, several hundred years that we thought about the brain. We now know, and we only learned this within the last 20, 30 years, that um, we can change the brain until we die. And we make 10,000 new neurons every day. But we have to be willing to participate in that change. And that's where the big challenge comes um, because it requires our conscious attention and intention to reshape the brain in a way that gives us a new opportunity for a different kind of expression of life in the world. And so here's a few things that, you know, to think about in the hyper complex world. It's always changing. It's more important just to be in the moment than spend too much time thinking about the future or the past. Um, emotional intelligence, as is most of you know, probably emerged in the last 15 years as a very, very important part of our, of our, um, of the makeup of ourselves. And compassion and practicing good things for yourself and others are really crucial for what the world we're in. Think about the last year with, with um, the virus. These are all pieces of who we can be that make a real difference in a world like we're living in just today. And, you know, daily gratitude, which we'll talk about in a minute. What am I grateful for today? That's something that, you know, is worth, like when I have the, the mindfulness bell, it's one of the things I do is, oh, 
my grateful award. Thank you very much. I'm grateful, you know, that I can have this call with you guys and girls. So there's another part of our awareness, our consciousness, it's really important that again has come down to us over the last 250,000 years related to amygdala and that lower part of the, of the brainstem that was with us for so long. And it's called, it's called the negativity bias. Our brain is hardwired to remember the negative things in life because that's what threatened us, our survival over the last several hundred thousand years. And so we have a preference for remembering as, as um, Rick Hansen says, we're Velcro for negative experiences and Teflon for positive ones. Um, and so that's something that we wanna both be aware of and begin to shift, which we can do by weaving positive emotions into ourselves and our brains. Um, it, but it takes an active effort. You have, to, you have to pay attention to it. But again, as Rick Hansen says, if you can take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. Every minute, we have a chance to restructure ourselves in the direction of being who we want to become. And then it takes care of itself. So I'm going to give you another one now. I'm gonna go to here. And we're gonna to go to here. I learned this from I've had I've spent a, I've I've taught a number of young people here in Bolivia about some of this. And one of the things I learned from them was that we don't like to listen to a lecture longer than 10 or 15 minutes. And we like to watch YouTube videos that explain these things to us. And then we like to talk about it. There's no sound. Is there sound now? <laughs> Jim, unfortunately, you're the only person that can get the joke because none of us can hear the sound. It's frozen. Can you see me? We can see okay. you, but um, we couldn't hear the couldn't I hear know, the video. It's frozen, I guess. No, it wasn't that. It was something I we would, we would have had to do technologically, technically, which I don't remember what. Well, because it really also is, but, didn't uh, run. Um, but anyway, uh, okay. So negativity bias is the point. Oh yeah, right. Marilyn says the sound is coming through your headphones. Anyway, somebody had a question Good. earlier, Jim. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, which is the question was how do you access the quantum field, and the the second part of the question is through meditation. Well, let's, um, I think there are different practices you can use. And it's, you know, I mean, Roger, you can comment on this. It's, it's questionable uh, about how and where and when one interacts with the quantum field. But we have a, we have a model that says it requires attention in order to collapse. The quantum wave, the probability wave 
has to be observed by something in order for it to collapse. So um, if we can access that, I'm, I, I think of a, an experience I had um, back in the 70s with a woman who was a very talented psychic. And in a reading she gave to me, she said, you know, as humans, we have the capacity to access, experience, remember the birth of the universe because the original particles that came with the Big Bang are still a part of us. They're a part of everything. And it reminds me of a one of the Siddhis, the powers that have always been talked about in some of the Indian contemporary tradition. Um, the Animan Siddhi <coughs> was a part of the power one develops through, through concentrated meditation to access the fundamental structure of matter. So you see, we're talking about a possibility within all of us where we can reach deeply into the fundamental structure of this universe and interact with it through our awareness in such a way that maybe it's a quantum probability collapse event. Um, it's just an intriguing notion. And if so, then it is manifested through our attention and intention. We have to imagine who we want to become, where we want to go, what we want to be. We got to uh, really pay attention to it and intend strongly. That's who we're becoming. And it's the future. There was a recent article just came out two weeks ago in a physics journal about some of the latest work they've done in the quantum world shows that time may be circular. It's not a straightforward line. And in fact, in the mathematics of it, they showed that it's possible a future event that is the result of a present event can affect that present event to become the future event. So see, we're dealing with mathematical and physical um, projections about the structure of the universe that then we bring back into ourselves and say, you know, like an experience I have, or I believe I have, is that in some of my um, practice for myself, I can sense my future self calling me forward. And if I listen or attend or whatever the experience is, participate in, in fully enough, I can see my path toward that future self that is that might be a little different than the path I might just take out of my old habits. So it helps me restructure the way or where I'm going. I, you know, we're into a real philosophy here. So um, I don't want you to think this is, you know, the, the agreed upon structure of matter and the universe, but it's something that people who think about this all the time and design it mathematically. That's our, that's our um, mindfulness spell. So we'll just take a minute and attend to what's going on inside of us. The thing about mindfulness, which is about attending to the present moment in a variety of ways, is that it gives us a greater capacity to implement some of the um, practices that I'm gonna go through now. So another important aspect of, which we've been touching on anyway, of what we know about the brain, again, we've only learned in the last 30 years, is neuroplasticity. That we can, with, the, with directed mental activity, we can alter the brain structure and function. It's a participatory event. And it's what I call using the conscious, consistent, and intentional repetition of carefully chosen thoughts and actions for the explicit purpose of building new neural pathways that we've been discussing that become the basis 
of improvements in our lives. And, um, you know, I like this quote that, that um, attention, see, attention, it's intention and attention allows us moment to moment to choose and sculpt how our ever-changing minds will work to choose who we will be in the next moment in a very real sense. You see, if we leave it up to the past, we will become tomorrow who we were yesterday. Tomorrow is dependent upon who we are today. If we take action today about moving in a different direction, then tomorrow will be different from yesterday. But if we don't, then it all just becomes the same me doing the same old things. And that, from my point of view, isn't good enough for me. I know there's a lot more, and it's a part of what we call self-directed neuroplasticity. <clears throat> and that you can change your brain to mind to change your brain to change your mind for the better, to benefit ourselves and other beings. Our experience matters because our experience shapes our brain. And it matters both for how it feels in this moment and for the lasting residues it leaves behind, woven into the fabric of our brain and being. Okay, let's take a break to see if there's any questions or if I should just keep going. Jim, there are a couple of questions. Good. One I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring in from um, a, a, a private exchange that um, Lori Litton oh, good. on the call um, had with um, you. And um, I, I thought it'd be, I'd love to hear you address it again. Um, I mean, Lori can speak for herself, but I'll start. Um, she basically was talking about, you know, a lot of the um, othering that people are doing um, around race and other things. And uh, what, how, how can all this apply to um, that? Um, you mean, how do we get out of the rat race? How do we make meaning of it? Or how do we integrate it in a way that... Yeah, hello, become... Laurie, are you on the call? Can you ask the question yourself? You're on the call somewhere. Laurie? Anyway, um, I don't see Laurie. She's not typing in. She was talking about there's a lot of, like, you know, um, hate... Um, activity um, on the part of um, people who don't uh, identified with the right wing, maybe progressives also. Uh, so Lori says she can't get audio. And, um, you know, so how can we, how can we, how can we do this? How can we use some of the things you've talked about to address that, um, this kind of behavior in ourselves and in other people? Um, well, let's go then to. I think I'm on now, but I'm on. Yeah, well, okay. ask the question for yourself, Lori. Well, I'm fascinated by neuroplasticity, and I'm also concerned about racist thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and how we can change that. It sounds like the individuals have to want to change. And with the negativity bias that Jim has been telling us about, it seems pretty dismal for us to address this in our society today. Okay, so I appreciate that, and and um, I would I look at it this way: we are living in a historic time of change. It's a it's an incredible time right now, because all of what you're talking about is now being discussed and in the middle of everybody's awareness, and it's never been that way before, and that's a, the first step: awareness, attention. Now, on the other hand, it's a huge issue. I mean, I remember, Roger, you may remember when we were talking about going to China at one point and uh, people were saying, you know, you can't get this stuff done in China like you're doing in the Soviet Union. And the basic consensus was you have to wait until all of the current leaders die. <laughs> and then there's a new generation maybe you can deal with. So there's an element of that, you know, at a certain point, um, where it, it, you have to look at it, from my point of view, in, in the sense of decades, not just weeks and months, because you're, as you point out, there are an awful lot of people who are immersed in the point of view you're describing, who have absolutely no interest in being anything different than who they are. So a part of this is 
activating, igniting within more and more people the, the passion to become what I call more fully human because of, uh, the human being has within us a much larger possibility for compassion and honoring differences and, <clears throat> and um, uh, related character traits than it does for hatred, etc. Hatred, in a sense, comes from the cave person days when tribes kept each kept themselves separate from everybody else, because everybody else was the enemy. And many of the people, many of the groups of people today who continue to accentuate the differences are, ex are exhibiting that tribal behavior. And we see it in some parts of the world. There's still tribes like this. Um, um, so and the only thing I know about it is that there's an evolutionary unfoldment here. And our task is to create ourselves in a new way. And then I would bring in the research with um, Transcendental Meditation they did several years ago, where um, they encouraged a group of TM practitioners to focus on nonviolence, peace, no crime, et cetera, in a couple of suburban areas. And according to the studies they did, um, the incidence of crime significantly went down in those areas. So there's a field effect, not unlike the, um, what they keep talking about, herd immunity. There's a field effect that happens at a certain point. And we are a part of the initiator of that field. Um, it's in a sense the, you know, the culture we live in is a reflection of all of who we are. So, you know, in a sense, our first task is to become more of who we can become. And then, as I was saying, you know, when some of you first got on the line, my point of view is we got to start teaching the young people how to grow into a different kind of being than what they're being taught to be with our current education system, et cetera. So we have a chance because we've got an emerging generation. My experience is in teaching um, 18 to 28 year old young people here in Bolivia, my experience is they come in with a significantly more awareness of these things than we ever had at the same age. We have a real opportunity in the world because young people, however you want to explain it, more and more people are being born into this world with a connection to spirit, in a sense, that, um, that you know, is, it was not the same when I was growing up, let's say. Um, but I would just say, you know, one little personal anecdote. Um, again, when I was five years old, some of you may have seen me uh, tell this story on that YouTube that Angelo Pop uh, sent around. When I was five years old, my parents taught my brother and me to pray. We were not a significantly religious family, Methodists, you know, so middle of the road. And we went to church on Sunday, et cetera. And um, um, every night before we went to sleep, my brother and I would kneel next to our bed. My parents were there. And we'd say, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep that basic prayer. Then afterwards, my mother would say, now say, ask God to bless and give thanks to everyone in your life who's meaningful to you. So I tell this story, and then we'd say, God bless Uncle Les and God bless the Aunt Hattie and blah, blah, blah. And but I tell the story because I realized that though that practice left me in the following years, it immersed me. Well, here's the other part of it. Um, it immersed me in a connection to spirit that was could never be untethered again. If you get us early enough, that's what happens. And what happened for me was 
I would then go to bed. And then literally, I remember it so clearly. I would, as I was lying there before I'd go to sleep, I'd say, okay, God, now let's talk. Like, you know, I did the ritual. Now let's have a real relationship. And I don't remember if God ever talked to me or anything, but it was, it was, it was structuring in my brain a connection to that deeper part of us that has never left. It didn't really become activated until probably LSD and some other, you know, stimulants. But um, I'm finding with younger people now that it is inherent in them, even if they haven't had that early um, instruction or conditioning. Um, and for me, the answer is the young people. That's why I'm involved in this university, this online university, particularly to create educational products that move younger people into a different way of thinking about the world than the way our current education does. So, you know, there's no easy answer to your question, and it's not going to happen fast from the point of view, of, from our point of view, in a sense. It'll happen very fast uh, in relation to the birth of the universe. Um, so, you know, it's a perspective thing. Um, uh, uh, billions of years versus a dozen years. Um, but it's up to us to be the agents of the change. And so that's the best I can do on that one. Um, Jim wants to know, I mean, excuse me, um, Richard Flack wants to know about visualization. Um, he says, um, how can we develop this, the, the art of visualization? Well, it's practice. Um, everyone can do it and, it, and it can be done in a variety of ways. It isn't all, um, can you see that picture there? Share, oh, there we go, share. Um, it can be done through language. It can be done through imagery. Um, it can be done through motion. Um, it's, it's, it's not so much about, in a sense, visualization, which suggests I have to be able to create big pictures in my mind, et cetera. It's about, you know, we, we process, we all process information somewhat differently. And, so, and we learn differently. Some of us are better learners with oral information, some with reading information, et cetera. And so we all have this capacity inside of ourselves and it takes, just takes some practice. And here's a, here's a good example. It's a, the neural substrate is the part of the brain that you reinforce to create a behavior. Mental activity, which is, which is much more than just visualization. It's also repeated phrases, um, um, affirmations, or writing things down and then reading it every day. Mental activity requires underlying neural activity and repeated mental activity um, builds neural structure. And that's the point. Um, and then it's a matter of practice. Mindfulness is one of those uh, meditation techniques that is good at this because mindful attention, mindfulness is really about paying attention to the present moment. It's about putting your attention on, in a sense, bodily sensation, what's happening right now in my foot and my knee, and uh, I can hear some sounds. And, but it's about putting your attention right now on what is. And in that field of awareness, attention pulls its contents into the brain. So you can do it by, um, for example, um, if you want to get a lot of money, there's a program I saw on, uh, I mean, an app or something where it has a blank check from the universe. And you can write your name in there and the amount of money you will get printed out. And then a part of it is every day you look at it and just reinforce, you know, I want to have, I'm, I'm going to have a million dollars by the end of this year. So it's about all of your attention, not just what we would normally think of as visualization. And directed, directing attention skillfully is the fundamental way to shape the brain. And that's a part of what mindfulness does. It helps us develop skillful attention, paying attention to your thoughts, being able to differentiate thoughts, et cetera. Um, 
And so then we've got all this research on mindfulness meditation. Um, it's a growing field of neurological research. It, it says, it shows managing stress, reducing depression, improve your mood, change brain structure, uh, et cetera, reduce pain perception. Um, and so mindfulness is one approach that has a significant physiological impact and mental, in a sense, spiritual impact on who we are. The increased self-awareness that comes through uh, meditation practice generally um, gives you a greater sense of empathy for others. So some of this emerges out of the practice without you know, um, thinking everybody's got to do it. Then I've got a little slide on different types of meditation uh, because different types activate different parts of the brain. And then we can associate that part of the brain with certain kinds of function. Um, so that Vipassana, for example, um, reduces stress and increases well being and self kindness. Um, and then there's certain things that happen in the brain. I like this one because I'm getting older that regular meditation practice improves cellular health, reduce the rate of aging within cells and a reduction of gray matter decay, making it possible for higher neuroplasticity over time. And that's, you know, that's one of those things, as you may know, as we get older, you know, brain cells uh, become to disassociate, et cetera. Um, so meditation is really important. It enhances memory capacity. Then I've got a whole list of the physical benefits, we don't have to look at them all because you'll all get them on the slideshow. But I did want to give us a little sense of, because this is what we have to think about when we talk about, you know, the rat race. The universe started about 15 billion years ago. All of this came into existence. And then for about 10 billion years, it emerged into an evolutionary experience in a sense that eventually be, um, gave birth to life on Earth. And then over the next four billion years, the modern human appeared slowly with a brain bigger than any other uh, animal species. And from the beginning of the appearance of that brain, it appears that it came, it exhibited spiritual awareness. And we can see this from the um, evidence of shamans, for example, uh, there's just something that came out recently. They found evidence of shaman in um, somewhere in the Middle East that is something like um, 200, it's about 75,000 years old, something like that. So it's clear that we've had this depth of spirit that, that expresses itself through us in some way for thousands of years. And of course, then that, that manifested into mystery schools and religions, etc. But then today, we've got the technology to investigate it. And that's a part of why uh, neuroscience and, and the wisdom traditions have come together, primarily because we have the technology to look at what happens in the brain when we contemplate God. Um, Andrew Newberg and Mark Waldman are two of the um, best researchers on this. Uh, there's a book out, How God Changes the Brain. Um, and it's quite interesting, as they put it, that different parts of the brain produce different experiences depending on how you perceive God or the universe or our mind or our lives. Um, and you need a certain balance of frontal and limbic activity to have a positive perception of that experience. So we're learning a lot more about how neuroscience, including the heart and the brain, are, are sort of designed to jump into uh, the Godhead, one might say. Um, and this is just an example of various, they've done Franciscan nuns, Buddhist practitioners, Pentecostal, and even atheists um, in reaction to spiritual experience or images of God, etc. And they're continuing studying Sikhs, Sufis, yoga practitioners, advanced meditators, etc. And um, one of the things here is that 
intense long-term contemplation of God or whatever that means to you and other spiritual values appears to permanently alter the structure of the brain. And especially those parts that could give rise to better moods, health, sense of self, etc. So contemplative practices strengthen specific neurological circuits that generate peacefulness, social awareness. So in answer to the earlier questions, this is one of the ways to get more and more people to just do, and you know, to do simple contemplative exercises like mindfulness. And you know, it is beginning to happen as some of you may know in the US, which is the only place I know about it. Um, there is, there's been a movement over the last eight, nine years of parents primarily who have pressured schools to bring mindfulness practices into the classroom. So there are increasing numbers of elementary schools who are teaching young people how to just simply be, become aware of the present moment and what they're feeling and what they're thinking and who they are. So, you know, it, it'll take some time, but as they grow up, that'll be there. Um, Angelo, back to you. Any other questions I should address before I go on? Suzanne. Uh, yes, uh, so my question is, <clears throat> do you have any thoughts about what the motivation of the universe could be in terms of creating a human? <laughs> well, um, my first response is that we have to be careful assigning human type processes to the universe. So motivation, I would associate with a human being rather than the universe. Who's stealing my screen? Look at that. He's taking over my screen. I'm going to try you and will, wipe um, him out. Stop, if you will stop screen sharing, we could see everybody. That's what I was trying to do, but I can't do it because you're, you've got control. You've got the con. So, so um, but to go on on that, um, it, it's sort of like, I mean, you know, none of us can uh, determine, in a sense, the, the the impulse of the universe in these things. Um, but my experience is that life is an inherent trait in the expression of the universe. And so it's not about a created human life. It's about life as a principal component of all of what happened at the Big Bang. And of course, it, it required certain um, um, chemicals, certain objects, certain physicality to come together in order to support what we know as human life. Um, but life as an impulse, I think, is inherent in the structure of the universe. But again, these are all just opinions. I mean, I know a number of physicists who would say, you're crazy, there's no evidence of any of that. And this isn't about evidence. It's, it's also about who do we believe we are and how do we then follow that path that takes us into our greater nature, if you will. That's as much as I can say. I mean, if anyone else has any sense of what the motivation of the universe is, please. Um, and we're open to hear. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so we got about five minutes. A couple things I want to say. Um, one is that um, Jim has uh, graciously um, um, agreed to um, have a follow-up that's more interactive um, with some people that couldn't show up for this one. And, uh, you know, we'll let you know about that. And also, um, I'm going to send out the, you know, the slides to everybody. So last, last questions or thoughts. Go ahead. We got a, about five minutes and then some people. Okay, so here's, here's a summary of the variety of practices. It says five, but they're now seven. Um, that, that take us into all of these things we've been talking about. Taking in the good. This is about negativity bias, overcoming that by regularly um, dwelling, sinking into the positive feelings and experience around us. Gratitude, probably most of you have heard this over and over. 
but daily gratitude has a huge impact on the quality of life that we all experience, appreciations. And then back pocket positivity, some of you have heard me say this before, but it's something that, that I kind of coined. Um, I make a list of three or four of the most positive experiences I've had in my life, and then sink into one of them. So for example, I remember Rogers, it might have been that 72 conference, I think, no, is it it probably the 79, um, six weeks in the Soviet Union I spent with Mary Payne. Um, and on my way back, I gave a, a, an address to the International Association of Humanistic Psychology. Um, and I talked about all of what was going on in the Soviet Union, et cetera, in human potential stuff. And, and hardly anyone had ever heard this before. But for me, it was like, you know, I just gave them a, a, the story of my travels. And I got a standing ovation. And I, I was like so many of us, I was shy and kind of, I kind of walked off the stage. Um, I didn't know what to do. Um, but in feeling into it, I realized how extraordinary it made me feel. And I keep that in my back pocket. I have a couple of others. So that whenever anything sort of in the negativity side erupts, I remind myself, and this is where the mindfulness practice is so important, it keeps you in the present in those situations. I remind myself to immerse myself in one of those positive experiences, and it changes my experience of that particular time and um, uh, the way my brain is structured. And then there are a few others, moments of choice. All of these have additional sides under them. Acts of kindness, so important um, to just take care. The smallest good deed is better than the grandest intention. And I want to go to that slide for a minute. Um, this is all about appreciation and gratitude. And that was my cat who died. And I appreciate him so much, Snowball. Um, Moments of choice, be with what is there, decrease the negative, increase the positive. Being with is primary. And then kindness. Um, this is from one of Rick Hansen's book, Ruta's Brain, The Kindness Practice, and random acts of kindness. The goal is to increase the well-being by consciously performing acts of kindness. And, and it shows that the research shows that college students increase their sense of happiness simply by counting their acts of kindness for one week. So I encourage you to keep a little journal and write them down. We would do that as an exercise if we had more time. Um, but write your own list this week to share with us the next time we meet. And here's an example, just random things. Buy a coffee for the next person in line at the favorite coffee shop. Or book the middle seat on a flight so people sitting on either side can get a free seat. But, between them. I mean, we don't do that much anymore because so you don't get on flights. Um, and then, you know, a few habits of strength and neuroplasticity, and then a few other things, being of service to others, self-care, being on our own side, that's important. And then some mindfulness practices. And then this is crucial. Unfortunately, it's very difficult now, but hugs, bring with them substantial health benefits. Um, and we can still hug our children at home if we live in a you know, contained family environment, but we can't touch anybody outside anymore. So hopefully that'll end sometime in the next year or so. But remember that hugs, lower anxiety, improve the heart, make people feel safe, boost serotonin levels, um, they teach us how to be present right now. They're very important. And then you're trying to um, um, cut me off, I know, um, Angelo, but I told you there's all kinds of stuff in here. Um, this is just something you may want to read um, about what's actually happening. We're traveling at five, 850 kilometers per second through space right now. I mean, how many of us are aware that um, we're zooming around the solar system and that solar system zooming around the galaxy, which is zooming around the universe. And that, you know, um, we're sitting still right now. We're not moving any distance at all. If you measure it 
relative to Carrier City. And, but in reality, there's no fixed spot to surface of the planet. Um, and planet Earth, in the time we've been reading this, we've traveled 100,000 kilometers through space. Um, it's just, you know, these perspectives, I was talking to Angelo about it earlier, um, they're challenging moments in our lives. And it happened the other day to me when, you know, people were upset and things weren't going too well. And I think, you know, remember the people in Texas, that's suffering, not the little argument I'm having or, and so it's, a, it's also about perspective um, and, and reminding ourselves um, about how the rest of the world is. It's one of the reasons I like living in Bolivia, my own point of view. Um, I, shortly after, well, a couple of years after I lived here, I moved here, I went back to Marin County and lived there for a summer. And I was interested to see that hardly anyone I encountered had any idea about how the rest of the world was organized. And, um, and I found myself sitting on a couch watching TV night after night and finally said to my wife, we both looked at each other and said, we've got to go back home. <laughs> In Bolivia, I can walk out my front gate and I can see people struggling for things that we just take for granted. And I appreciate being reminded all the time of how fortunate I am. I, it helps me be grateful all the time. So I encourage people to, you know, reach out to the rest of the world in a way that gives us a greater sense of thankfulness for who we are and what we have. Is that enough for you, Angelo? <laughs> uh, no, Jim, but uh, it'll start, it'll, it'll, it's, it'll, I can't unmute. Why can't I unmute? Okay. Yeah. It's not enough, Jim, but um, we'll return again. And, um, you know, this has been great. Um, and so, Julina, I'm sending the PDFs to everybody. Uh, so you'll see all this, all those things. as. Thank you. Uh, and then we're also going to have, um, there will obviously be a video recording of this. And I have a number of friends who couldn't attend today. So I'm going to schedule another meeting where we play the, the video. And when we come to discussion, it'll be live. We'll all be talking about it so that I can include more people in this ongoing conversation. And I'll let everybody on this call know too, in case you wanna go through it again.